Today on CityCast Philly, it's the Friday News Roundup. We're talking about how authorities took down a multi-million dollar catalytic converter theft ring in our area, who showed up to the Mütter Museum's first community meeting this week, and why a Philly doctor wants you to eat animal organ meat. It's Friday, October 20th. I'm Trinae Ree, and here's what Philly's talking about. Joining me this week is Rodrigo Terrejon, criminal justice and law enforcement reporter for the Philadelphia Inquirer. Hey, Rodrigo. Hey, Trinae. Thanks for having me. Sure. And Alan Yu, science reporter at WHYY. Hey, Alan. Hi, thanks for having me. Sure. Before we get into some of the Philly news of the week, I want to start off with an icebreaker. The Phillies have been top news of this week. Uh, Have any of you watched any of the games during the National League Championship Series? Yeah, I saw the Tuesday game where the Phillies blew them out, which was a lot of fun. Blew Uh, out the Diamondbacks. Yeah, (laughs) it was great. (laughs) Alan, what about you? I have never seen a baseball game. I've seen baseball movies. What? Alan, you're from Philly now. You got to watch a game. (laughs) I have an agreement with a friend of mine in Chicago that the first time I watch a baseball game, I'll watch a Cubs game and he will explain how the game works to me. Oh, Alan, no. We need to have it. We need to renegotiate this. So Um, hopefully it will not be a (laughs) Cubs versus Phillies game. Uh, right. <laughs> well, okay, Rodrigo, since you actually watch a game, who's been your favorite player uh, during this series? So I know like maybe three names of players. <laughs> the one that stands out, I like Kyle Schwarber just because uh, he runs similar to how I would imagine I would run if I were a professional <laughs> baseball player. <laughs> So That's he's my funny. favorite. Yeah. <laughs> so my my favorite player uh, during this series has been Nick Cassianos. Um, all the home runs, especially Harper and Turner, and pretty much all of the pitchers. There's so many I can't name them all, but yeah. That's uh, it's just been great. It feels good to to be winning, you know. Yeah, definitely. Everyone's in a good mood. It's yes. just like another excuse to just like have like almost like a weekend during the week, which is Yes, I love that. All right, let's get into some of the news. Um, People who aren't having a good time are some uh, vehicle owners in our area when they find out that their catalytic converter had been stolen. Rodrigo, you've been covering this story just about how authorities had to take on such a sophisticated multi-million dollar scheme. Kind of catch us up on what's been happening over several years now. Sure. So the biggest development happened at the end of June. The Bucks County District Attorney's Office announced at a news conference that the office had charged 10 adults, a juvenile, and a Philadelphia tow yard for running this sprawling operation that basically stole around 2,000 of catalytic converters, uh, which are these exhaust emission devices that are on most cars. They're very valuable uh, for the precious metals that they have in them, like uh, platinum, palladium, and rhodium. So people often steal catalytic converters because they can send them to a refinery and extract those metals, which are worth thousands of dollars for a few ounces. So at the end of June, Bucks County announced that they had uh, charged those uh, 10 adults and one juvenile. And the tow yard itself is called TDI Towing. And it's actually, it was based in Port Richmond in Philadelphia. And from 2020 to 2023, the office believes that TDI Towing purchased around 27,300 catalytic converters for a total of $8.2 million so dollars. So it's a pretty massive operation. They bought and sold and resold and also had people steal the catalytic converters. So it was kind of this top to bottom illegal operation to commodify catalytic converters illegally. 
Right. And we've talked about this story on the show before, but was I just, you know, want to bring back up is that, I mean, is is this still going on? Are drivers still reporting missing catalytic converters to authorities? Definitely. Definitely. It's an ongoing problem. A few years ago, it kind of spiked as an issue in Philadelphia and in the Philadelphia region. But it is a, it's a nationwide problem because of the value of the precious metals that are in catalytic converters and also the level of skill that the cutters, which is the name for the people that actually go under the cars and will snip either end of the catalytic converter to remove them. It's uh, the skill that they've attained at this point. It's become a process that they can actually do within less than five minutes. So there's been instances where someone's parked the car in front of a business in broad daylight, a cutter will slide under, you know, jack the car up, slide under and cut the catalytic converter before the person comes back out of whatever business that they went into. So in Philadelphia, this year alone, there were 1,802 reported thefts across the city through September 18th, which is actually a pretty massive improvement over last year when there were 4,173 converter thefts stolen in the same time period. So there is an improvement, but it's still an ongoing problem in the city and in the region. And you also report that this ring, the the ring that um, was busted in June of this year, it took more than, you report, more than two dozen law enforcement agencies. Is that normal? Like, can, can, you, can you give me a sense of like, how big um, this actual ring was. Sure. So, yeah, it took more than two dozen law enforcement agencies, including obviously Bucks County District Attorney's Office, which was the lead on the investigation, Philadelphia Police, Montgomery County District Attorney's Office, some FBI field offices. It was a massive, massive group of law enforcement agencies required to take down this uh, illegal operation. So in terms of the scope and the reach of this organization, there were cutters that would work in Philadelphia and bring back uh, catalytic converters to TDI towing, but they would also go into Bucks County, which is how the investigation started. The prosecutors say that the cutters and the people that were stealing catalytic converters would purposely try to steal catalytic converters from outside of the Philadelphia area to avoid suspicion because obviously if they you know stay within their footprint there's a higher chance of them getting caught and then there's also you know allegations of them going to places in New Jersey going to places in other parts of uh, Pennsylvania not just Bucks County so it's there's been reports of thefts and transactions you know across county lines and state lines. Wow. Uh, Rodrigo, if you find yourself a victim, what type of reprieve is there? So Bucks County District Attorney's Office, in the wake of this takedown, have actually set up a hotline and an online form that you can access to start a potential process for uh, restitution. The unfortunate reality is that catalytic converters don't really have any sort of serial or tracking number. So it's very hard to kind of match up if, let's say, you got your catalytic converter stolen. It's kind of hard for investigators to match up your stolen catalytic converter with a particular organization, in this case, TDI Towing, to see, hey, you know, this is definitely a theft that occurred during TDI Towing's run. So it's been hard to get restitution. Of course, you know, with insurance, there's been... A lot of insurance claims put in because of this problem. But the, in this particular case, the district attorney's office set up this online form and this hotline for people to report thefts and say, hey, I think maybe my catalytic converter was stolen and maybe it was part of this TDI towing operation. Mm-hmm. 
Maruchan superfans are everywhere. From the busy moms who want to deliver maximum flavor in a flash, to dorm room diners who want to put some slurp in their step. There are a ton of copycats you could use, but if you want to bless your bowl, there's only one true Maruchan. Whether you choose instant lunch, ramen bowls, yakisoba, or restaurant quality gold, Maruchan is the only ramen worth obsessing over. Smiles for all, Maruchan. See what all the ramen hype is about at maruchan.com. All right, we're going to move on to um, the Mütter Museum's uh, story. This week, Alan, you reported that the Philadelphia's Mütter Museum, which is known for its medical history, hosted a community meeting. And this comes after months of controversy. We've covered this on the show before. Um, the museum has new leadership. They decided to remove online exhibits and videos Earlier this year, citing an ethical review, there's been conversations and debate around just how human remains are used in the museum because some of them did not come from patients who gave consent for their bodies or body parts to be displayed at the museum. Alan, just catch us up. Uh, I'm curious, what happened at this meeting this week? Yeah, so uh, they had this community meeting where anyone who registered uh, could attend and basically tell the museum what issues they had with the recent changes in practices and where they want to see the museum go in the future. And this was actually quite a heated meeting. You know, you had people who were living donors who had donated parts of their bodies to be on display at the museum for educational purposes so people can learn about the conditions that they have. You had people, you know, who were more critical of the museum's practices and asked questions about what about the people who did not consent to have their remains put on display and whether or not there was enough provenance research done basically to figure out where these specimens in the Muta Museum came from. And then you also had, you know, people who were just very passionate supporters of the museum, people who liked what it stood for, who found it very emotional for them to be able to see, in some cases, their own conditions reflected um, in the displays at the museum. And so all of this came to a head at this meeting where you had, you know, and management made it clear that this meeting was not for them to respond they were just there to listen. And so you had this kind of at times tense back and forth between, you know, people who wanted the Muta Museum to stay the way it was. And then you had people who accepted that, you know, that there certainly is a need for an ethical review, but that felt that the new leadership has not been handling that well. And then you had people who were uh, more critical of the museum and what it stood for and questioned how much of it should should continue to exist in its current form. Wow. Alan, how many people showed up to this meeting? I would estimate around 60 to 70 people showed up at the meeting. And then there were more people who, uh, who watched a live stream online as well. Alan, I know you talked, you, me- you mentioned the people, um, some of the people that you talked to. What did they actually tell you? What, what kind of stood out? Was there any a story that stood out to you as to why someone came to this meeting? So, yeah, I mean, the story that stood out to me uh, was this biomedical engineer, Rachel Lance, who flew from North Carolina to Philadelphia for this meeting because she had donated a uterine fibroid that she had removed uh, during a surgery last year to the museum. And her friend had also donated her birth heart after having heart transplant surgery. And she uh, was there because she talked about how much the museum meant to her. And also that since the new leadership came on board, that she has not been able to get any answers about, you know, what has the museum done with the specimens that she and her friend provided and that they provided because they liked what the Muta Museum stood for and wanted the parts of their bodies to be put on display so that people can learn about the conditions that they have. And so that stood out to me because right, it's rare that you get to hear from living donors to the museum's collection and also just the amount of effort that it took for her to get there, right? She had to, you know, right. fly across states to be there. Right. So Alan, is the museum gonna host more of these community meetings? 
Yes,、uh, the plan is to have them every four to six months or so, and this is part of a public engagement project that the museum、uh, got grant funding for, and that project will last two years. So there will be more meetings like this to come. Great. Alan, another story that caught my eye this week is one that you also reported on about Dr. Jonathan Reisman, who is on a mission, as you report, to change people's minds about eating animal organs. I have so many questions,、um, but first, what what what's happening here? What's going on? So,、uh, Dr. Reisman has. Actually, done this before. So he got interested in cooking from anatomy class because his professor would tell him, and and the class, what parts of the human body corresponds to which. Which muscles that are served from 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 beef, and then that made him realize basically that there's a lot in common between、uh, the animals that we eat and、uh, and 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 ourselves and and our, our own、uh, body parts, and so that made him interested in the idea of organ meats, and he learned from his own family recipes and from his work around the U.S. and in some cases around the world that you know many parts of an animal are. Are in fact edible, even though they're not sort of mainstream cuts that you see in the U.S. And so, it's part of his mission to host these、uh, what he called anatomy eats events, where you have special menus made specifically from organ meats, parts that most of the U.S. public don't often see, you know, on restaurant menus or in grocery stores, but. In fact, are edible and so don't need to be discarded or don't need to be treated as waste. And he does this to one.、Uh, he says to. Uh, reduce the amount of waste in the meat supply system, and also to help people learn more about the anatomy of animal bodies. So, by extension, they learn about parts of the human body as well. Interesting. I grew up, and my my grandmother made some liver and onions. I mean, as a kid, I was like, "Oh no, Granny!" <laughs>、um, but it wasn't bad. It wasn't bad. And I have eaten oxtail,、um, which is like a Jamaican Caribbean cu- cuisine. It's really good, really savory, and like a stew. That's been good. Rodrigo, have you had any animal organs? Yeah, definitely. So I'm Peruvian, and my some of the Dishes that actually are my favorite. I guess it's tripe. I guess it is in English.、Uh, mm-hmm. Cow, cow stomach.、Uh, I've had liver. I had liver a lot when I was growing up. Super protein and iron rich, which is great.、Um, I think that's like the those are the craziest organs that I've eaten. But yeah, I grew up eating organs. Now, growing up though, did did whoever prepared it for you? Did they tell you as a kid like this is actually what you're eating, or did they tell you something else? <laughs> like hide it? Yeah. <laughs> no, my parents were pretty direct about what、okay. I was eating, and then I would make a face, and then be like, "All right, I'm just gonna eat it anyway." <laughs> yeah, same here. <laughs> yeah. What about for you, Alan? Yeah, this is a traditional part of you know Chinese Cantonese cuisine as well. So tripe is also a a a big dish in Cantonese cooking. And then we would have you know kidneys, certainly livers, chicken hearts that sometimes is part of a stew or a curry. So so yeah, this is quite、uh, common, I would say, among you know southeastern China in in the Cantonese cooking. And yes, my parents also told me what it was because like to describe the dish, you would have to name it basically. Like like that that that's、right. what they 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 say the thing is. Right. Okay, Alan. When's the next tasting event that uh, Dr. Um, Reisman is having? So the next one is going to be on October twenty fifth, and it will be at La Croix at the Written House in Philadelphia. All right. That was Alan Yu, science reporter for WHYY, and Rodrigo Terrihan, criminal justice and law enforcement reporter for the Philadelphia Inquirer. Thank you both so much for joining me this week on CityCast Philly. Thanks so much, Trey. Thank you very much. This was fun. It's time for the tip of the week, where we share a life hack for living in Philly. The Pennsylvania Department of Education has opened up their nominations for the state's 2025 Teacher of the Year. It's a way to highlight and celebrate educators doing an outstanding job teaching our kids. 
You can send your nominations in now and you have until December 15th. We'll have the nominations link in our show notes. If you have a tip of the week, we'd love to hear from you too. Call or text us at 215-259-8170. That's all for today here on CityCast Philly. Our lead producer is Laura Benchoff. Our producers are Abby Fritz, Elizabeth Kama, and Lizzie Goldsmith. Our Hey Philly newsletter editors are Natalia Aldana and Joel Wolfram. Our host is me, Trine Nuri. Music is by Philly's own Interminable, with additional music from All the Kimonos and James Weldon. If you enjoyed this week of episodes, tell a friend, rate the show, leave us a review, and subscribe to our morning newsletter, Hey Philly. We'll be back Monday morning with more news from around the city. Have a great weekend and be safe, y'all. Bye.